Hello, my name is Lee Presser. This is my show. I speak frequently to very interesting people. Some of these conversations are so exciting, so intellectually stimulating, I thought others might like to listen in. This is the reason we started recording Conversation with Lee Presser. Welcome to Conversation with Lee Presser. The United States Electoral College is the institution that officially elects the President and Vice President of the United States every four years. Electors are chosen by each state of the United States and by the District of Columbia, but not by territorial possessions of the United States. The number of electors in each state is equal to the number of congressional districts in the state plus the two Senate seats. Currently, there are a total of 538 electors. That number is derived from 435 representatives plus 100 senators plus the three electors allocated to Washington, D.C. John Judd is an elector from the second district of the state of Missouri. He's here today to talk about how he was elected to that position. We will continue with a general discussion about the Electoral College and the mechanics of electing a president and vice president. John Judd, welcome to the conversation. Thank you for having me, Lee. Well, you're very welcome. So you're one of 538 human beings, citizens of the United States, who actually elect the president of the United States. I think back on November 6th, people thought they were, but in fact, they were really electing you, weren't they, in the state of Missouri? Yes, um, I'm one of 10 in <coughs> Missouri that will be casting ballots for Mitt Romney and Paul Ryan. So the, uh, the, the mechanics of this was, was what? I mean, people went to the polls and they voted um, in the state of Missouri, as in every other state, but they voted in, in Missouri uh, for either President Obama or Governor Romney, and in Missouri, Governor Romney got the majority of votes. And so how does that translate into you being an elector? Well, because Governor Romney did receive a majority of votes yeah. in Missouri, it's a winner-take-all system, and therefore, he will receive all 10 of the Electoral College votes mm -hmm. from the state of Missouri. So let's see, there are <coughs> eight congressional districts now. You used to have nine, right? Yes. But now you've got eight, plus you have two senators. That's where the 10 comes from? Yes. So in each congressional district, there's somebody just like you who, how did you happen to become in the position to become an elector? Well. At the April 21st, <coughs> second congressional Republican convention, and in seven other respective congressional conventions, um, I ran, and anybody can run for the position of elector. And so on April 21st at Lindbergh High School, I was nominated for the position of elector, and I didn't anticipate running unopposed, but I did happen to run unopposed. And of course, whenever you run unopposed, it greatly increases your chances. Voila, there you are. <laughs> so I was nominated, I think yeah. is the correct term, at that point. And then on Tuesday, when the voters uh, chose Mitt Romney to be in the majority in Missouri, then I officially became elected to be a presidential elector. So there was an opposite number in the second district, some Democrat who had also been nominated to be an elector as well, right? Yes. And so when people were voting for Romney versus Obama, in fact, in the second district, uh, they were actually voting for you versus this other person, right? Absolutely, yes. So now, <coughs> because, uh, because Romney won the vote in Missouri, you're saying that all of you Republicans who rep the 10 votes you're the ones who are going to get to vote. Yes. Talk about that process. When and where is this all happening? Um, according to the state party, uh, we 10 Romney electors will be notified by the governor, but we already know what date we will be voting on. It'll be on December 17th, and that date is set by law. Yeah, by federal law. Yes. Right. It's always the first Monday after the second Wednesday in December. Yes. Which is an interesting time frame. Go ahead. So we'll travel to Jefferson City that day and go to the designated place. And 
um, once we arrive there, we will uh, proceed to vote on the first ballot for Mitt Romney for president. And then that ballot will be over with. And then we'll have another ballot and the 10 of us will proceed to vote for Paul Ryan for vice president on mm -hmm. that second ballot. And that'll be taking place in the same similar manner throughout the country on that day. In various state capitals around the country. And yes. in Washington, D.C., th there's three votes that are, that are happening there as well. Um, is, this, uh, is this ceremony public, or is this like in a private room? It's uh, public in the sense that uh, representatives of the media will be there, all the TV and radio stations from around the state. And it's public in the sense that uh, whatever room they have it in, we'll get as many citizens as we can in that room, you know, that day. Mm -hmm. So so then your vote, um, uh, you, you have two separate votes, one for president, one for vice president, which is different than the way the Constitution was originally written, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Let me expound on that. Um, in the original Constitution, it said that the electors shall name two persons and the person receiving the highest number shall become president of the United States and the person receiving the second highest number shall become vice president. Well, that wasn't working very well because in, in 1796, John Adams barely defeated Thomas Jefferson. So you had two political rivals, one in the office of the president, John Adams, and the other in the office of vice president, mm -hmm. Thomas Jefferson. And then in 1800, Thomas Jefferson barely beat John Adams. So Thomas Jefferson is en route to becoming president, and John Adams is en route to becoming um, vice president after being a defeated president. So this process of having two people from different political factions uh, was not working. So in 1804, in the 12th Amendment to the Constitution, uh, it was decided that henceforth we would vote first a ballot for president and secondly a ballot for vice president. Now the effect of this was to lead to two members of the same political party, if you will, being elected president and vice president. Now, you, uh, <clears throat> you're a Republican, yes. and so therefore you're planning to vote for, uh, for uh, uh, Governor Romney and also for uh, uh, Congressman Paul Ryan for vice president. But you're not, by law, required to do that, are you? Electors are basically free to vote for whomever they choose. You could vote for Barack Obama. You could vote for Joe Biden. You could vote for Joe Blow, right? I understand that I could. But on the 21st <clears throat> of April, when I was nominated or elected, if you will, at the Second Congressional Convention, on that day, I filled out and signed a form giving my word that I would vote for the nominee of the Republican Party, mm -hmm. and that I would vote for the uh, vice presidential nominee of the Republican Party. So I always like to keep my word, and I will be keeping my word on December 17th. There's a term for, and, and it's only happened on rare occasions throughout American history, but there's a, a, there's a term for people who are electors like yourself who are supposed to vote for one candidate, but don't. They vote for somebody else uh, called faithless. <laughs> faithless electors and there there has been talk about uh, whether they can or can't be punished legally but apparently uh, that just doesn't happen they're just shunned and of course because you are a respected member of the Republican Party had you voted or do you vote for somebody else uh, you'll, you'll wind up not having many friends in the Republican Party anymore would you there's not a snowball's chance of that happening <laughs> and the most recent occurrence was in 2000 when one of the Al Gore electors, instead of <clears throat> voting for Al Gore, abstained. And so that's how you end up with the number of 271 for George Bush and 267 for Al Gore.
for whatever reason, she chose to abstain in her vote for Al Gore. Yeah, I read something about this, this, uh, this elector. It had something to do with D.C. statehood. She, she represented the uh, District of Columbia, and there's, there's a big deal. I mean, these folks who live in D.C. want to be treated like a state, and, um, <clears throat> and they're making arguments as to why they, why they shouldn't be. But nevertheless, um, I, I guess we can cover this right now. The, the people in Washington, D.C., this is District of Columbia, the folks who live there never used to have a vote for president, did they? That's correct. In 1961, our U.S. Constitution was amended when the amendment was officially ratified. And what it did was we as a nation decided we want to involve the citizens of D.C. in the presidential process. So henceforth, uh, they received uh, three electoral votes, uh, two corresponding as if uh, they had U.S. senators and one for as if they had a U.S. Uh, congressman. And, um, yeah, and, and the rule is that they can never have any more than the least populous state. So if, uh, like in the example of Wyoming, Wyoming only has three electors, two senators, and one, uh, one House member because they have such a low population. Uh, every state that has th only three would have to go to four before Washington, D.C. could ever possibly even think about getting to, to four no matter how large your population is in Washington. Yes, and the political reality is that um, the District of Columbia is always going to consistently favor the Democratic candidate. So um, I'm sure that the people knew that when they approved this amendment, but it'll be the most consistent going forward for the Democratic candidate also. It's interesting that um, the last time that we added states, which would be 1959 and 1960, we brought in two states of opposite parties, Hawaii in 59, or I'm sorry, Alaska in 59 and Hawaii in 60, as I recall. And uh, uh, Hawaii being a Democrat state, Alaska being a Republican state. Yes, um, that leads me to the question of Puerto Rico statehood. They now, just had a vote, didn't they? Well, yes. There are a lot of folks that would like to become a state. Some would like to remain a territory. And some would, I imagine, like the same situation that the District of Columbia has, to at least participate in the process. But my caveat for the Republicans who control the U.S. House is that I think that you're giving another three electoral college votes to the Democratic candidate for president. Mm -hmm. But, of course, that's not the basis upon which this decision is always made, though. You know, the, the, I mean, throughout American history, it's not been political party so much as are they ready. The, the Constitution talks about territories and converting them over into becoming states. Uh, you have to have, what is it, 50,000 50, citizens of voter age, and then they have this vote, and they can, they can vote to become an independent country. <laughs> <laughs> they can vote to remain just a territory, or they can vote to ask to become a state. They don't, just because they vote, like Puerto Rico does, doesn't mean that they do become a state, right? Absolutely, and if they voted on Tuesday in regard to it, that wasn't the first time. So they're, they're continually expressing their will as uh, inhabitants of Puerto Rico about which direction they would like to go into. So. Well, it'll be interesting to see how that happens. But you're right. Then instead of 538 electoral votes, then there'd be 541. And that would then raise, you'd need 272 votes, I guess, to become elected president of the United States, uh, somewhere around there. Right. A and uh, so it, it, it would be, you know, that there is that balancing act. Well, maybe they make... Washington estate, no, that was, that'd be two Democrats then, right? I think mostly what they're concerned about is actually in the Senate more than they are in the House. Mm -hmm. um, so, all right, um, we have the, uh, the Electoral College system was, uh, why, I mean, have you studied up on this? Why, why do they go, w instead of with the, which most countries do, um, a direct vote? I mean, you know, it's, if you belong to a club, 
<laughs> and you're voting for president, you know, there's, you know, eight guys that say, you know, I want this guy, and seven guys say I want that guy over there with the ones that vote eight, well, he becomes president. But that's not the way that the people who ran the Constitution the Convention decided to pick a president of the United States. Any idea why they did that? Um, no, but I'd be of the opinion that it's, it has served us well. Um, and there is a movement called the National Popular Vote Bill um, that would establish an interstate compact. And once uh, states representing the majority of the Electoral College uh, would pass this bill, then um, those states would be, those electors in those states would be bound to vote for the winner of the popular vote. Now this bill was put forth in Missouri and it didn't go anywhere, but other states have already passed it. So, um, not many though, it's like eight or nine, right? Right, right. Yeah. They think they represent like 131 electoral votes because so, California's in there and they, they got 55 votes all by themselves. So, but uh, they're, still, they're still clearly short a bunch, uh, 140 some votes of, uh, of uh, being able to, uh, to actually have a majority of electoral votes in this compact. But that sort of changes the whole balance of the way that presidents are elected, doesn't it? And Missouri, I was surprised that Missouri of all states actually uh, even discussed this. Well, the bill uh, went before a House committee and it was heard in the House committee, but um, there was a lot of opposition to it. I traveled to Jefferson City to speak against it, a lot of opposition. And then the committee did not even take a vote on it. Who proposed this thing? Uh, that would be Representative Scharnhorst. He's a believer in it. And uh, so we're likely to see it uh, come back again next year in the General Assembly. I see. So again, just to remind people what this, uh, what this plan is, that states will agree instead of to vote for whoever won that particular state, like in your case, um, uh, Mr. Romney, if you join the compact, you would actually be in line to vote for President Obama, correct? Absolutely, because he did win the popular vote. Um, so that, that would be who I would be bound to vote for if this bill um, would pass. Well, has it happened before that uh, somebody who had won the popular vote, didn't become president of the United States? Well, the example that everybody will clearly remember would be 2000, when Vice President Al Gore did win the popular vote, yet uh, George Bush um, won the electoral vote by the vote of 271 to 267. Um, and I believe it has happened prior to that also in our history. Yeah, actually, I, I kind of knew that, but uh, I wanted you to, yeah, you to talk about that. Yes, actually, we've had some interesting outcomes uh, uh, in the United States. Uh, I mean, starting starting in um, let's see, the you mentioned seven, 1796, where uh, we had that interesting little uh, almost oopsie where the president wound up as a Federalist and the Jefferson being the Democrat as his vice president. That'd be kind of like Obama winding up with Paul Ryan as his vice president. So if Obama ever died, all of a sudden the, uh, you know, the policies would change dramatically with the, uh, vice, the Republican vice president ascending to the presidency. Could I mention now that I happen to be a presidential elector in 2000, so I've been blessed that, you know, on the 17th of December it'll be my second and final time to be an elector. But in 2000, of course, with the uh, situation in Florida, the whole election for president came down to the 25 electoral votes in Florida. If they go for Vice President Gore, he becomes president. If they go for George Bush, he becomes president. So a lot was riding on that particular state. Um, and um, that's just an indication of how the system works um, going forward. 
Yeah, the, uh, I mean, this time uh, in the run-up to this 2012 election, there was a lot of talk about Ohio. You know, who, uh, I mean, th it was expected that it was going to be like 50-50 right till you get to Ohio, and then whoever wins Ohio was going to, uh, was going to take the election. So you could have, again, wound up with um, Romney winning the popular, Obama winning the Electoral College, or vice versa, um, but it didn't work out that way. It all did it. No, um, and President Obama had different paths to his 270, and I think that Mitt Romney had to have Ohio, had to have Florida. Those were... But he didn't get either. All right. <laughs> Th those either. were must-win states for right. him so to get to 270. So once, you know, that went that way, then we knew that President Obama would be reelected. So what would be the big deal about switching out from, um, I mean, it was seven, 1787 when they made this decision about the Electoral College, and here it is, 2012. So what would be the big deal about saying, like, hey, we have all these computers and, you know, all these abilities to count votes, um, you know, I mean, the communication issues are no longer an issue. Why not just go with popular vote versus the Electoral College? The reason is because what you're doing if you do that is you're obliterating state sovereignty and state rights um, so that a vote like mine would be thrown in with the folks from San Francisco and New York and also you're changing the dynamics of the campaign in the sense that if we eliminate the electoral college the election is just going to be conducted by candidates going to San Francisco and New York running up their numbers there and the rest of the country is going to be ignored. So I would be opposing that change. Yeah, I don't think people really understand that, that this would be, uh, let's just say that the vast majority of people in New York City, the vast majority of people in Chicago, the vast minor ma majority in, in Los Angeles, uh, in Dallas, uh, in other large cities, all wanted to go in one direction. Uh, the people who live a different lifestyle in rural parts of the country would simply be dragged along and have uh, very little say in this matter since the large cities is where the population is the, you know, is the determining factor in, a, uh, uh, in, a, in an election based upon uh, just sheer votes as opposed to the federal system of each state having uh, a little say in who's going to be president. Absolutely. In other words, right now, states elect presidents, not individuals. Yes. The winner of the majority of the popular vote within that state is who gets all the electoral votes. Right. And as an elector, you represent Missouri, not the individuals who actually voted for you to become an elector. Well, um, since you brought that up, I have verified that um, in the Ann Wagner Congressional District, that did also carry for Romney. Mm -hmm. So I'll be obviously representing the majority of voting Missourians when I vote. But in essence, I will be representing um, my second congressional district, which is the district from which I was elected mm -hmm. when I vote on the 17th. Um, you got about five minutes left. Say I told you time goes by fast here. You got about five minutes. And at this point, I usually turn it over to the guest and say, if, the, if there's things that we haven't talked about yet uh, that you need to, and want to talk about, start. Well, I'd like to uh, make our viewers aware that in Missouri, because of an archaic 1949 law, we 10 electors will be compensated for going to Jefferson City and voting. And I'll be urging Missourians to contact their state representative and their state senator because I'm not in favor of this uh, situation. It, since it's a 1949 law, our per diem is $5, and uh, we get compensated for mileage for traveling to uh, Jefferson City. So this is a Missouri statute, Missouri. Not, not a U.S. statute you're talking about? Yes. Okay. Yeah, well, okay. There's, there's I just don't believe that we electors should be compensated for doing our duty of traveling to Jeff City on the 17th and voting. Mm -hmm. I wanted to also mention mm -hmm. that um, if we do it the same way we did in 2000, um, 
we will handwrite out the name of Mitt Romney, and then after that election's over, we'll handwrite out the name of Paul Ryan. Mm -hmm. Well, the interesting thing was in 2000, one of the electors misspelled Cheney's name, and uh, that was very interesting, but I got to give credit to the governor and the Office of Secretary of State because they handed his ballot back to him and said, would you like to spell this correctly so that we do elect <laughs> a vice president on this day? So it was a very interesting uh, that's, that, thing that to be is, part that of. That is interesting. I, I came to find out from my reading that there's actually uh, six documents that are created by each of the, uh, uh, each of the electors that uh, uh, one gets sent over to the pre president of the United States Senate, two gets sent to the uh, Secretary of State of Missouri, uh, two gets sent to the archivists of the United States, and one gets sent to the U.S. District Judge who represents uh, Jefferson City. I guess they want to spread that around and make sure that there's no monkey business. I believe that these votes are uh, officially, according to law, um, certified or opened in a session of the United States Senate by the Vice President. In, in early January. So um, even though through media sources, we'll know what the total is on the 17th of December, they also go through the process of opening them in the Senate. And uh, two mahogany boxes are sitting in the front <laughs> up there on the table uh, in alphabetical order. So I'm, so I read and uh, they go through these things and there's to uh, the, the vice president and then two guys, one Democrat, one Republican, they both verify exactly what's going on there. That's good, an open process is exactly. always good. And it's not always the vice president. Sometimes in the past it has been the, uh, the, the president of the, of the Senate. But uh, that's a pretty rare, rare event. As a matter of fact, uh, Al Gore oversaw his own, uh, his, his own non-election. Yes. As vice president, he, he's the one that got to count the votes for uh, George Bush to become president instead of him. Yes. Now, um, I have to put my party hat on a little bit. As you know, now the state of Missouri has carried in 2000 for the Republican, 2004 for the Republican, 2008 for the Republican, and 2012 for the Republican. So Missouri is becoming a pretty solidly red state for the office of president, mm -hmm. just as Illinois is becoming pretty a solid pretty solidly Democrat. Democrat state for the office of president. Yes. So uh, be interesting to see as we go forth towards uh, 2016 uh, how this all plays out. Right, an open seat that year. Yes. Well, that's about it. We've run out of time. Thank you very much for being with us and sharing uh, all this information about uh, being an elector in the Electoral College. And to my uh, audience, I've been speaking with John Judd. He is a United States uh, Electoral College member from Missouri, the second district. He will, on uh, uh, December 17th, be actually voting in Jefferson City for President of the United States. See you next time. And uh, this program will also appear on YouTube. Thank you. Goodbye.